how are you? Hanging in there? I'm pretty good now. Mm-hmm. Better than I was uh, two or three weeks ago, I'd say. Um, I think just the acclimation that always happens uh, mm-hmm. has happened. Yeah. Uh, for, for me, at least, to, to a large extent. I mean, the world is still fucked up and uh, <laughs> yeah. home life is not back to normal. But yeah. now this is, I think, week five or week six of yeah. our quarantine at the house. So, yeah. Yeah, Zoe, my eight-year-old, asked me that yesterday. Uh, what week is it? Like, what week? How long have we been doing this? I was like, honey, I don't know. Uh, I'd have to figure. <laughs> I was like, you're lucky. I know it's Thursday. So. Yes. Yeah. That is. It's almost like we're in like the new time calculation. Like time started at zero with the quarantine. <laughs> kind of, yeah. like, we are now in in week of the seventh. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> Pretty much. All right, so we got a bunch of questions. I thought we'd kind of wander around um, in the questions and just talk about various things. We can kind of ref. We obviously want to make it through our the whole the whole topic list, and I figured we'd go about forty five minutes or so. so. That's okay. Um, well, what I do just first, perhaps, is just um, I had kind of hyped my <laughs> my keynote and what that was going to be about, and I just wanted to sort of address that a little bit, yeah, which please. was. Our plan was to launch a brand new product right the week, actually, before RailsConf. <laughs> so we were going to launch Hey.com the week before RailsConf. And we just had a bunch of new tech in that app that I wanted to talk about. And then when all this sort of happened, well, I went three weeks where I did nothing. Um, but rant on Twitter and try to pressure companies into doing the right things and all sorts of other things except program Ruby and make right. progress on the product and therefore also make progress on the things I wanted to talk about. And that was kind of how I ended up with, do you know what? I just, I don't have the product out I want to talk about. I don't have the technology wrapped up. So rather than do this kind of uh, half-assed thing where I can't actually show and tell, I can just tell. Yeah. I'm going to, we're going to save that. And, um, Kind of do that whole reveal of, of how we do the front end differently in Hay once sure. Hay is out. Sure. So okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sure pe- that, that that question got asked on Twitter. Like, hey, what's going on with <laughs> yeah. that thing? Um, right. So yeah. I mean, we've got com- some kind of uh, maybe adjacent stuff we get into on there. You know, for instance, if you like, if you want to get into it, uh, you know, like one of the questions we can, I guess, we could just dive in with that is, you know, people were interested in stuff like. Um, you know, have you been doing anything different on mobile? Like you're building a, you've been, yes, you're building yes. a, 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 an email app. Uh, we presume it's an email app. Um, and uh, people read email on their phone. So I, that was that maybe a good, like, have you been working on that? I mean, I know that Basecamp has, has an app still. And so, and uh, that's been, and I remember when you first came out with that, there's been an evolution there too. So yeah. Um, any thoughts on? Sort yeah. Of... No, that's a that's a that's a great question. And I mean, it goes directly to what I was going to talk about. Like our whole philosophy of making apps at Basecamp is, first of all, the majestic monolith that at the center of not just the web app, but at the center of all the apps lives this majestic monolith. That's not just an API server either, right? Like when for Basecamp, for example. Um, when you in our native iOS app go to a message, that rendering comes straight from that majestic monolith. It goes straight through a controller, straight through our ERB view, and it spits out HTML. Mm. Now, what has changed over the years and has changed um, even more so perhaps in Hey um, is where is the border, right? Like how much of the work comes from HTML in terms of the majestic monolith, and how much is sort of a native fully native uh, application. And we've added more and more native stuff, but still that that was taking it from like 1%. Like our, I, I had a write up, I think four or five years ago, maybe even a little more where I talked about like, hey, 99% of Basecamp is just the web. And then there's 1% of native stuff that wraps it. Now it's perhaps a little more like 10% is native, mm-hmm. 90% is still the majestic monolith. And we followed the same approach in, in Hay, but we've just kind of doubled down and expanded upon it um, mm. in, a, in a large variety of ways. Where with Basecamp, the native apps were kind of weren't an afterthought. We we sort of had it in mind, but with Hay, 
we started with the native apps from right. day one. Right. I mean, this whole idea of building a, an email app that doesn't is nice on the phone makes no sense. Sure. So for for Basecamp, I think it's something like seventy or eighty percent is still actually desktop use, and oh, then yeah. we have twenty to thirty percent on on mobile. But you go to email, and it's probably the other way around, right? Like it's probably eighty percent is going to be on yeah. on the phone, and twenty percent is going to be on the desktop. So we went from the start and said like these don't just have to be good; they have to be great. And yeah. we got to do the full native thing right from the get go. And I think perhaps there it's it's interesting where we picked a different path than than some. Like our native app wrappers, they're written in complete native. We don't use a Ionic or uh -huh. some other way of kind of getting to the native stuff. We have fully native teams that work in on iOS. They work in in Swift, and they use all the default Apple stuff. Yeah. And then they just put web views everywhere, right? <laughs> right, I was going to say, yeah. Not just web views, but Turbolinks web views. Um, mm -hmm. Turbolinks sort of forms the, the core of all this interaction, such that it's fast and it's not continuously reloading and, and all these other things. And we do the same thing on, on Android. On Android, we use Kotlin. And we use, again, the standard um, Android setup. And we can kind of, we can do that because we have native teams. Our native teams are still tiny, though. We have two programmers on each side, two Android programmers, two iOS programmers, and a designer for each team. So it's huh. teams of three. On iOS, they handle both um, the iPad and the iPhone, and probably also going to handle the Mac app for um, for Hey. And then on Android, um, well, it's mostly Android, the, the phone, yeah. right? So, but kind of like the philosophy of the approach has, has remained the same. Like, for me, what I want to write, I want to write Ruby. Yeah. I, and not only do I want to write Ruby, I want to write as little sort of, I want to write as much of the application in Ruby as possible. Um, so that's the other thing where we've kind of taken a different path than the rest, most of the rest of the industry is that our Majestic Monolith, again, is not just about an API server. It really has HTML in its core and we try to do as much as we can so that we can write uh, applications in kind of like the vintage style. Yeah. I, I like to think of it like, in terms of developer ergonomics, the peak of the web happened in like 2004. In terms of the <laughs> sure. board, right? And think about like, oh, well, that, that means it's like you're just stuck in your ways. This is just, fuck no. Like, look at what it takes to develop a modern app with like a full API split distributed system um, react on the front end, the whole shebang, right? Mm -hmm. The number of moving pieces is just enormous. Now, yeah. some people go like, well, that's just what we have to do. That's what modern is. And we just went, no, um, we can get virtually all the benefits you get from that model um, in the traditional approach with the traditional ergonomics yeah. that just makes that wonderful Rails productive experience um, by going through things like Turbolinks and, and I mean, then the rest of the picture was, was sort of what I was going to present and I, yeah, I'll talk about sure. that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But general philosophy is that. Yeah. I think it's, you know, it's, it's such an interesting uh, approach to, because it allows you to keep, I imagine, I guess, I imagine the ability to keep your, your design team small, right? Because you imagine like if you have a, if you have all native, like no, none of this, if you're like, I'm going to build a completely native uh, app, then you're like, okay, great. Like I have three different designer design teams because I got to design the one and I got to design the other oh. one and I got to design the third one. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That, that really probably is the number one benefit here is that we've picked this architecture, not just because we think it's a good technological approach. I think it is. I think it's great. I think it's, it's a, a lot of fun. But we picked it because it works for our company size. Sure. Like yeah. we are 56 people at Basecamp. Um, 15 of those are or even a little more are on support. Like we have very small teams. As right. I said, like Android, there's three people for all of it, right? right? For iOS and iPad, three people, all of it. Could they rebuild an app like Basecamp from scratch in native? Right. There's like 260 screens or more. Never, ever going to happen. You'd need a team of uh, of tens of people, right? And that's our entire yeah. development team is tens of people, right? And then you'd have on, to duplicate the, support again, too. You'd have to have a different yes, support yes. for iOS, too, then, too. Yes, yes. And like we just we didn't want to do that, right? You look at our we call it core product. 
Um, that, that's the team that develop all the features uh, on the web. It's for developers. Like that. Yeah. That's it. Like, and the reason we can we can have such a small group, like you count all that up, right? So two developers on Android, two developers on um, on iOS, and then four. That's eight developers, basically making the whole app. Right. Right. For everything on all the platforms at once. That's just not compatible with like recreate everything everywhere. You do the whole thing as like this big distributed app. And I think I'm glad you asked about the designers because I think that's also what's weirdly unique. I look at like, why aren't more people doing it? All of our designers, they don't just like draw, right? Like that's not what design means at sure. Basecamp. They yeah. make, like all of our designers, they write their own JavaScript. They write their own Ruby on Rails code. Now, it's not necessarily the final thing, but every single developer or designer we have, they can stand up like, hey, here's what the feature is going to look. And now, yep. if it's complicated on the back end, obviously, programmers are going to come in and they're going to help with it. But like a, a lot of features we actually have, they'll, they'll end up fully shipping just off a designer. Yeah, they absolutely. just jump into the book because they can, right? Like right. Ruby on Rails is approachable enough that like if you're a designer who knows how to make HTML, you know how to make CSS, you can jump into it, you can figure it out. And I think that that's also one of those things that's unique about Ruby and why it's just such a wonderful language. Is it, like it, it allows people to make that small jump from JavaScript, like, hey, I know a little bit of JavaScript, to like, hey, I also, I can do it in, in, in Ruby. And then they can do full suggestion because they own the whole stack, right? right? Like one generalist at Basecamp can ship an entire feature to everyone on every platform at once. Right, absolutely. Which is, you compare that to a lot of other organizations and how they're set up, and it's absolutely not how it is, right? Like, I've, I've been ranting about this idea of specialization. Like, we've really gotten to the point where, um, in a lot of organizations, the layers are getting sliced thinner and thinner. Yeah. Well, I am a front end engineer for like this <laughs> platform. Well, yeah. Holy shit, that is just such a small slice compared to, hey, at Basecamp, um, there might be sort of leanings or you have a preference, but like everyone can do everything and they do it most of the time. Yeah. So that's a good, that's a good segue into another, another kind of question I had, which is, so I, I, Basecamp has been, well, Prior, the pri 37 signals prior has been around for how long? It's been 20 years almost. 20, 20 years, yeah. So it, it'd be interesting, like, you know, uh, we don't have to go super, super long on this, but like, it'd be interesting, like, if you think back on like where you were and where you started, do you feel like you've, like, obviously things have changed as technology's changed. We've all gotten older. Every, like, we're stuck at home now. We were stuck at home 20 years ago. But it'd be interesting, like, to kind of get your feeling, like, do you feel like if you were to look, if you were to project forward, or look backwards either either direction and say like do i think it would look like this are you there or it, what has surprised you has it been fairly consistent in that time that's a good question i think my overall take and maybe it is just because i'm i'm getting old and uh, curmudgeon at heart is just like things just don't change that rapidly like sure. i look at i look at the um original ruby and rails codes that i wrote like what is that like 16 17 years ago yep. You don't have to squint that much to see how we still write apps, yeah. right? In fact, um, if anything, and maybe that is again that nostalgia, and, and I can just imagine kind of like, well, this just proves that you're old and like you can't evolve, blah blah blah. <laughs> but like, I'm holding back to that and like, do you know what? It, it, it's funny. It's kind of like the same thing with music, right? Like, a, a lot of people that they'll go with their most, um, the, the time in their life that was most formative, that's yeah. when they track the most sort of stubborn um, <laughs> preferences for music. They're like, hey, right. if your life was great in 84, fuck, you love 84. <laughs> music, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think I have perhaps some of that and, and I'll accept that right up front. But um, some of this, again, goes back to the sense that like that, developer ergonomics experience that we had in the early days, 2004, 2000 to 2008, before kind of the pressure of, of what you needed to do on the front end with JavaScript was was kind of tearing things apart. I'm holding on to that, like the fucking 84 hairband, right? Like this yeah. was so, this was the peak in many yeah. ways of, um, of the developer ergonomics experience. And that's a lot of why I'm here, why I'm, I'm still here, right? So I'm, I'm, an executive at a company of 56 people have the CTO hat on. A lot of other people who have that hat on, like they don't program that much every day anymore. Sure. All blessed be with that. Like 
I would just go nuts if that was me, right? I need to program every week at the very least. And I've been, I've had just had two weeks in a row. That's why I was such in such a cheery mood when you, you asked me about like, hey, how are things going? They've been going great because for the last two weeks, I have had basically nothing but Ruby programming in my hand. I've been programming like four or five hours a day. And it's just like, I, I shut my computer at 5 p.m. and I just go out of my office with a goddamn smile on that wide. <laughs> And the reason the smile is that fucking wide is that there is that just joy of the work and the joy of the impact and the joy of kind of the um, the dance, the aesthetics, yeah. um, the, the, everything that sort of hopefully we all love about Ruby, although I just got into a, a tangle on Twitter the other day where someone was like, well, people only care about programmer aesthetics or something. They're toxic. Um, all right, <laughs> sign me up for that. Toxic I am. Um, I care so deeply about that. And like, it, that hasn't changed that much, right? Like we, we continue to fiddle at it. I, it's the same thing where I look at the evolution of Ruby. You look at, I just did it the other day. I was like, oh, I wonder actually what got added in Ruby in the last few versions that I would sort of use. And it looked like 2.7, 2.6, 2.5, 2.4. You're like, things aren't changing that radically because they're great, right? Like uh, it reminds me of... Um, I think it was uh, Johnny Ive who, who was remarking of something about like why some design for either for a Mac or something hasn't changed. And he was like, at Apple, we're not just looking to make change. We're looking to make things better. Right. So I, I've really internalized that sense that like you can get to a certain point where if you don't have an idea for making it better, the most likely thing you'll do is you'll fuck it up by changing it, right? Like you'll make it worse. And there's so many things we keep making worse all the time. Uh, this industry is just uh, sort of a, a group hug of amnesia where <laughs> we, we go like, we've learned all these things. Like it's funny, obviously with, with Ruby, uh, when I got into that, like I would talk to people who were into small talk, for example. Yeah. And they were like, all the things we had, like the refactoring browser, the live, the image, the thing, it's like it was lost to the ages and it still hasn't been rediscovered. <laughs> um, and now, now, like in some ways, some of us Ruby folks are sitting in that camp shouting to the JavaScript people, but the things we had, the things we <laughs> so had, true. right? Yeah. And, and so I, I look at all that and go like, you know what? The, the world hasn't changed that much. The really the main thing when I look back over the 20 years of doing web apps, the things that changed was the iPhone. That's yeah. pretty much what I can point to. Um, and like that was the big change for me that you really needed to tackle in a different way. And what's kind of ironic is that like that change has almost um, petered out to some extent because when the iPhone first was introduced, it was like, just a horribly slow machine and you had to build web apps in a different way. You couldn't yeah. uh, do it in the same way. So the CPU was just terrible, right? Now I just benchmarked my <laughs> iPhone 11 Pro yesterday. It was putting down like 160 on the speedometer 2.0, um, which is compared to like, I have an iMac Pro with like, I don't know, fucking 12 cores that does like <laughs> 130. My MacBook uh, 16 it does like 120. Now the fastest computers we own for operating the web yeah. are our phones. Yeah. Um, and, and it's getting crazy. Like Apple just released that uh, the new iPhone. What's it called? The uh, SE. Yeah, the SE, right? A three eight hundred ninety nine dollar phone that has that chip that does one hundred and sixty on this parameter two zero. Just like, poof, right? So in some ways, um, like th that mobile change is now more of a UI change. It used to be a thing we needed to care about. Like when we built Basecamp two, we built an entirely separate. JavaScript model for the web views we needed on the phone because we couldn't run the real JavaScript. It was just too slow. This was 2013, 14, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like there's some convergence where things are getting sort of back and they're getting better. Um, so anyway, on the tech yeah. side, I don't think things have changed that much. I think a lot of people think they have changed a lot. Yeah. And that like now you have to do all these things. Now we have to have 15 people just to stand up a CRUD app because you've sliced it into all these different specialties. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a fucking blind alley. And I think it's a terrible way to go. And it's such a weird thing where we, in the Ruby and Rails community, like, hey, it all exploded. 2000, I don't know, five, six people go like, oh, wow, this is new, this is changed, this is different, right? And then we had sort of, I don't know, five years until JavaScript kind of got a second uh, uh, wind 
where everyone just internalized and adopted this idea that like, hey, productivity is good. Having one developer being able to do a lot of progress is good. And then we got to this point where like, oh no, now we have to make a basic thing. Yeah, there'll be uh, 15 developers and nine months. <laughs> Plus tax. Um, and you just go like, what? what, what? Yeah. And I think perhaps some of what did happen was that um, Silicon Valley started sloshing so much fucking money around yeah. that it just didn't matter. It just didn't matter whether your MVP needed 15 people plus tax, right? Because you could just hire whatever, right? Versus Ruby and Rails and the whole ethos was born out of, hey, what can you do with one developer, right? Like I built all of Basecamp myself. I installed it on the servers. I operated it. I did the whole thing. I needed a toolkit that could do that, right? And we've right. kept that ethos going up until now. And I think perhaps now this pendulum is going to swing back where someone goes like, yeah, I can't do the 15 developers plus tax anymore, right? Like we just right. don't have the money. Now things are, anyway. That's yeah. A long no, I think that, you, yeah, no, no, that's great. I mean, I think that what, you know, one interest I had on here uh, that I had uh, this morning on my list was, uh, this interesting on uh, this swing um, and is, you know, I think that uh, a couple of things I was thinking back on when you were trying at, at, at RubyConf in San Diego that time when you were trying to get Rails 1 out. And I just th I was thinking back on it and being like, if if you were to look at an app now that that DHH would look at an app now, you'd be like, yeah, this looks basically the same. Like, oh, what's a concern? There's been maybe a few concepts in there, but it look effectively right. the same. Um so the other the other thing that's interesting is you know like we had that like sort of we're talking you you had mentioned like like the monolith the, the, the majestic monolith and I think it's it's it even in, it feels like even just the last few months we saw we've all of a sudden we've seen again you know we had we had yes. the monolith and we saw the microservices and now we've we, like everybody's like hey you know what let's just go back to monolith again I feel like that has that zeitgeist has become again which is it's it's so interesting I feel like I feel like there's a lot of things that that you personally as well as Rails have been like you know like kind of just the steady like the the small sine wave and that the rest of the industry has been the big sine wave and like it matches back up sometimes again. Yes, yes. So there's all these very interesting theories and like kind of like the historic dialectic and you swing back from theses and um, yeah. uh, antitheses and hypotheses and like back and forth. And I think some of it is is um, not to get this too political, but I look at someone like Bernie Sanders, right? Dude's been saying the same shit for 40 years. No one gave a crap in like the 80s, the 90s. And then all of a sudden, like 2000, uh, something starts uh, simmering, 2006, all of a sudden people show up, hey, that dude's got some points, right? Like he's like, no new points. Just you look <laughs> at a clip from like 72 and you're it's like, yeah. fuck, I mean, slightly more hair perhaps, like otherwise same dude, same, same shit, right? Yep. The pendulum swung to him. Yeah. And I think of the same way with, with Rails, it's like the pendulum keeps swinging. You're never going to be in the sweet spot forever. That's just not how the world works, right? Um, so we were, we were swung in, in like 2006 to 2010 or whatever, yep. and then the pendulum started swinging back. We kept going, right? Now the pendulum is swinging <laughs> back again, and we're like, yep, still here. <laughs> still got a bunch of answers. Yep. So like all these questions you're rediscovering, right? Like that amnesia sometimes, mm -hmm. like it runs in cycles, and that's partly why the pendulum keeps swinging. I saw this thing about like the number of developers in the world doubles like every three years or something. So just the influx of new yeah. people, like the average age someone has spent in the industry is very short. So yeah. that's the explanation for the amnesia in, in large oh. part, right? Like someone comes into the industry and they go like, what's hot right now? Rails used to be just a hot thing and that used to be the default. Now it's, it was no longer the default. Now you go like, oh, React is the default, right? Yeah. And then at some point people sort of grow up through that and they go like, eh. This kind of hurts. Yeah. I wonder if someone has some uh, some some massage tools here that, that we can use. Can, can we stop some of this hurt? Like, why yeah. does my neck have to crane like this? Yeah. And we go like, hey, hey, we're, we're, we're still over here. It's still good. And and I think that that's where, um, where, where things are coming back to. And the other thing, too, with that is if you are investing your ego into, like, I want to be the hot shit and we always got to be the hot shit, like, you're going to have a bad time because nothing stays the hot shit forever. Yeah. So for me personally, like, why am I still working on Ruby on Rails after uh, 17 years? Because the hot shit was like a sideshow. The main shit was what I just talked about, that bliss of me getting to do 
Ruby on Rails for two weeks straight, walking yeah. out with the biggest grin on my face at five o'clock because I got to work in this amazing environment. Like that's the main attraction. When the yeah. main attraction is your own intrinsic motivation, yeah. the other stuff can come and go. Yeah. Right? Same thing as we said with, with Sanders. Like if he's saying the shit he actually believes, right? He's not trying to sort of uh, focus group his way into like what should the message be. Mm -hmm. um, it's so much easier to stay consistent. It's so yeah. much easier to stay in the game. And I think that's the game we've 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 stayed in. And yeah. the other thing there too, it's just like um, things just don't change that much. We love to believe that they do. Oh man, technology is so fast. No, it's not. <laughs> like you look at the broad scheme of like what has happened in programming over the past sixty years. There's these there's these blips where shit yeah. did happen, right? Yeah. But like legitimately, when I look at um, functional programming, is another great example, right? Functional yeah. programming is a huge rise, obviously. But like it was also there before, right? right? So it's, it's again, it's sort of this amnesia where we kind of just feel like to make our own lives interesting on a broad scale, we kind we kind of have to run around in these circles. Sure. Um, so. Yeah. yeah, that's actually a good. That's another good a good segue into sort of like um, maybe a, 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 a not a lighter topic necessarily, but a slightly different topic, which is you know like so you've yeah you've you're going in you're working on your stuff and like other other things that you look at like other technologies, stuff that you would look at and be like, yeah, this is just like, it sort of sort of to, 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 to sate that crave in some way and be like, oh, maybe I want to go write assembly, uh, you know, like uh, M68K assembly today. Is there, are there things like that? You know, we had some questions about like Crystal or Truffle Ruby yep. or uh, uh, TypeScript, things like that. Are there things in there? They don't necessarily have to be stuff that goes, that go into, into Rails, but stuff that like maybe you like to dabble with, you like to play with on, uh, at times. Yeah, it's a it's a good question because I think I'm a misnomer in that sense. Like I, the way I approach a lot of things is when I don't know what to pick. Like I'm I want to try all the options and I try everything and I figure it all out. And then at some point I'll reach my conclusion, and those conclusions can stay stable for a very long time. I have not, up I have not found a better programming language than Ruby, right? And I've I've tried a fair number of different things, but um, I am so intensely enamored by what we have in Ruby and how that model works, that the pool of a lot of other things is just not really there. And a lot of the things that to me, for example, makes Ruby special is the fact that it's um, it's dynamically typed. So typing for me is really, I mean, I'm allergic. And mm -hmm. I, I, I don't say that with necessarily pride because I do recognize the benefits you can get from um, static typing or inferred typing in, in different ways. But you know what, I'm not willing to pay any of it. Like TypeScript is probably the closest where you can go. There are uh, a number of people, the, the JavaScript crew we have at Basecamp, they're pretty uh, fond of, of TypeScript. I look at TypeScript and like, and like I'd rather not, right? Like I'd rather not do that. So we actually don't, we use TypeScript to write some of our uh, library code. We don't use TypeScript to write our application code at Basecamp. Oh, we still cool. just use uh, JavaScript. JavaScript, I'd say modern JavaScript, like ES6 plus, is mm -hmm. probably the closest where I go like, you know what? This is a good time. Like yeah. I'm not having a bad time. I used to have a bad time writing JavaScript. <laughs> I used to really like JavaScript very intensely. Yeah. <laughs> S6 plus JavaScript, not bad at all, right? And some of that is like, I just, I'm an OO programmer, right? Like you yeah. have these sort of leanings. Functional programming is great. I like a bunch of it. It has influenced my code style. And Ruby is this wonderfully, poly uh, paradigm language where you can mix and match in such a great way. But like my emphasis is very much on the object oriented side of things. So in that sense, like I'm not, not like super interested in that. And then I look at some of these other things like Crystal or, or other Sorbet or these other things that can mm -hmm. add uh, type to Ruby. And I go like, I love that we have such a big tent that, that people can yeah. play with that. There's no fucking way I'm gonna do it. <laughs> Matt, if, Matt, if you are listening, do not put this into Ruby. The Ruby we have right now, and it's a relationship with typing, is wonderful. Do not fuck it up. Like, I look at something like PHP, and I go like, I have fond memories of PHP. The PHP I look at today, no. Don't try to be something you're not. Like, there, there are an endless amounts of environments and so on that already do these other things. We don't need to turn Ruby into another version of that. Ruby is beautifully unique for what it is, and a core appeal of that, what that is, is the um, 
dynamic typing, at least for me. Now, I've had some conversations with other teams, like uh, the teams at Shopify, their experiment with Zorpay. They uh -huh. have legitimately different concerns, and like the kind of bugs that they see in production, I go like, huh, okay, that's fascinating. I guess different things happen when you have 100 plus programmers working on a single code sure. base and like, whatever, right? Like they have different concerns, and I fully, accept the limitations of my preferences are born within like long running code bases made by small teams of stable crews who work together for a long time. You can mm. do different things. You didn't, you need different safeties on your knives, right? Like yeah. we can have the sharpest goddamn knives in the drawer that are really good and precise. And like, yeah, they can't cut a finger off, right? That's all. That's the whole thing about the rope to hang yourself. Yeah, you can use the rope to hang yourself or you can use it to climb up to a more beautiful vantage point. We're yeah. using that rope all the time to climb up to the beautiful vantage point. And I'm not fucking giving up a rope just because someone can use it to hang themselves with, right? right. The same thing with the sharp knives. So in that regard, like, yeah, I'm, I'm boring like that. Like I'm really <laughs> intensely focused on, on finding the right thing. And then once I do, like I move on to other things. Like there are other things that then interest me. Finding another programming language is not high on my list of sort of hobbies. Sure. Um, it's a good, uh, so one thing you mentioned that would be a good, a good sort of track to take is, you know, so in addition to, to you know, working on, working on Basecamp for as long as you have, you've basically been the, the head, the top of the Rails open source project for, for a, basically about that same length of time. And so it would be interesting to hear sort of, you know, uh, how that has your role with the, the larger project has evolved over time, but also like kind of what you look for in people who work on the project. I mean, the core team, the people who come and go from the core team over time. And, uh, and in, a, in some ways, uh, the core team, you know, sort of some of the, the, the things that, you, that you've espoused today sort of map towards things that you look for in people who are on the Rails core team as well. So anyway, so 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 yes. I'll, I'll I'll let you talk about that. Yeah. No, 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 that that that's great because it totally did change a lot. Like when I started working on Rails or when I started extracting Rails in 2003, um, obviously I wrote it all myself because that was what it is, was, right? And then for about a year after it was um, made public, I just took patches. I still committed everything myself. These days I write the minority of Rails directly myself by my own hands. Like I am, the role that I play now is is more like the biggest fan, the biggest user, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I care extremely deeply about um, like how it feels to use it. I care a little less about like necessarily how it's implemented. Like if you ask me how is the active record relations model set up and implemented, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head or like uh, how's the view optimizations how do we do caching for templates and so on and I have this fuzzy rough idea and I could look it up and I could probably follow the code but I can't recite it I can't write it on a whiteboard right. um, and that has changed because we've just got such an influx of people who care very deeply about very specific things and I go like wonderful now I don't have to care about that anymore <laughs> right there's someone who now knows the the depths of the relation model in in active record and I can go wonderful do you know what I'm just gonna park that shit out of my brain like I'm gonna I'm gonna pour it out actually like I'm gonna just go banging <laughs> on my head and just gonna flow out and then I can fill in some new shit yeah. I can fill in some new stuff and I can let that play around and then we'll have someone else who lines up to um to kind of do that and I think that that to me was always my my hope for rails that we would have people who individually cared about different things mm -hmm. and then we'd all come together and we'd go like hey this is better i can share my part like hey i care a lot about api design let me do some designs here i care a lot about extracting new frameworks uh and everything from action mailbox uh, uh active storage all these things come from me using the framework and going like you know what i don't want this shit in my app this should be in the framework such that i have it next time i do another app yeah. um and, and so I do that, and then we have all these other people who show up with all the other stuff. I think um, the experience with MERB, which was this sort of alternative framework um, that was doing a lot of the similar things to Rails back in 2009, eight, mm -hmm. um, but from a different um, care, like the people who were working on this cared about some different things. Um, as for in Yehuda, like there was a lot of things about performance and extensibility and so on. And we thought in the beginning, like, well, I don't know if I ever thought, but there was a misconception that like, well, it's Rails doesn't want these things. They don't care about speed. They don't care about extensibility. And I was like, no, 
I just don't, it's not that I don't care. It's just not, that's not my focus, right? Like that's not the main thing I want to do. So um, you can do it. If you want to do it, like wonderful, come, please come come in here, right? (laughs) That's what we have right now in in the Rails core group a lot is we have a bunch of people who care about different things. Like um, Aaron and Eileen have worked a bunch on on performance stuff. They've worked on um, making active record work better at GitHub. Um, and then we have a bunch of people also like from Shopify and so on um, that kind of bring all that stuff in and we go like, hey, this is great. We're sitting at this big table yeah. and we're sharing all the plates. Yeah. Um, so, so that has really, that has been the philosophy. I think it's been like that for a long time. And I think that that's the, the most successful or easiest path to get on the core team is just start caring about something that no one else have to care for, for a while and like show up with the work and go like hey here's a bunch of stuff that i care about and i made better do you like it and like we're all gonna go yes yeah i think that's that's super great to hear i i love the idea of thinking about you as just like the super fan right like just the person who's like hey like like hey like you know like i have an opinion about this because i want it to like it works the way that i like it to work so let's maybe not change it because like i i want it to work that way right i love that that idea that you you're sort of like the the person who arrives at the uh, the amusement park and is like what new rides are there today like don't but don't take my i love these old ones don't take the old ones down but what new rides are we going to do today right that it's and it's not like i'm building all the rides myself no, totally. And I think that has changed. Like I've gone a lot where um, I'll put on like an idea of like how I, I'd like to see something work. And like I'll just open a pull request. Like I'm kind of using the executive privilege there, right? Like sure. uh, normally we don't use pull requests for, for feature requests, but I'm like, I, I really want this thing. Is there someone who's interested in doing that? Um, and I'll, I'll pop it on there. And um, another tactic I often use, um, which uh, I found very rewarding is I'll make a really shitty version of what I want. And then I'll put it up there. Oh. And if there's one thing programmers love to do, it's point out shitty code, right? Oh. Like they're like, well, here's a thing that's kind of shitty. Like I, I, I can make it better, right? Like I think I'm I'm good at not feeling embarrassed about shitty code. Like I'll yeah. write some shitty code. It, actually, usually it's not necessarily the code is shitty because I do care about making it nice, but it's like, it's very incomplete. Sure. Or it's slow or it's, it's all these other things, right? And you put it out in the open and like a bunch of people show up and they, they want to help. They want to make it um, they want to make it uh, make it better. So I I pulled back more and more like the drafts that I share now. They're so fucking rough. Right. Like I remember when 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 we first published when I first published Ruby and Rails, like I poured over it to like the point of perfection. Partly I could because. I think the first version of Rails was literally a thousand lines of code. Sure, like, yeah. I read those thousand lines of code, I mean, hundreds of times, changing everything and making it perfect, right? Now Rails is not a thousand lines of code. I don't even know how many lines of code it is, but it's a lot, right? Uh-huh. It does a lot. And um, I've just gone like, hey, I, let me just make the rough draft. Let's get someone uh-huh. else involved. Let, let's work together with someone else, and then um, we can move forward with it. Mm. Nerd snipes. So you just love to like go out there, do a little nerd snipe. Like, hey, uh, like here's here's the thing that kind of it sort of does the right thing. People are like, no, I'm the expert on this, and it needs to go exactly like perfect. Can you just do it for me then? Right. Uh, I'm very susceptible to those, as my coworkers will tell me as well. So, um, yes, uh, it's so, a honeypot. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, thinking about like just the evolution of Rails as well. You know, are there things if, if you look back on the things that you've that you've added and taken away, or things that like patterns maybe that don't work as well as they used to? I think that uh, like you know one of the questions that somebody had was uh, like you know what are we doing with asset pipelines and how that has migrated or changed over time? And I think I added in here like uh, do we still do you still use table polymorphism and stuff like that? Um, like other things, just like, it doesn't have to, you know, it's just like, this was good for now, and now, eh, maybe don't use it anymore, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's good. I think f- with the asset pipeline, um, we ended up building, or building essentially like the transpiler approach um, that has since taken off immensely in JavaScript before the JavaScript community was really <laughs> that interested in, in working on it, right? Um, and now they are. 
And now there's a bunch of great tooling for it. It doesn't make it, Rails doesn't have to do that anymore, right? Gotcha. So we could pull back and go like, you know what? The asset pipeline doesn't need to be on the forefront of um, of the JavaScript development. Now, it's funny though because then people go like, well, why don't you just sh shift completely such that all assets are run through that CSS and everything else goes through it? And I'm like, because it's not better. Like, have you tried actually including CSS in in Webpack? Fuck no. It's not a nice experience. It's not great. It's not better than what we have. So I'm in, in that regard, I'm very much like Ruby with the poly paradigm approach. Like I'm a poly solution approach. Like, hey, let's keep the asset pipeline in place to do things like copying images and dealing with um, with CSS as long as it does that better in a nicer way to use than the alternatives. Yeah. Um, I like Webpack for what it does for JavaScript. Uh, we don't really tinker with it. I think we use something that's pretty close to the standard Webpacker uh, config. It does that great, wonderful. And then we use the asset pipeline for, for CSS and the combination of these two things is great. Like I don't have, there's a lot of people in, in, in programming who have a very pure approach, right? Like I think that's part of the appeal of JavaScript is like I can use the one language for both the, the back end and the front end. Sure. Like that means a lot to me. And I go like, that means nothing to me. Nothing. Um, I, I, I don't give a shit. In fact, it's even more militant than that. I think it's bad. Um, there's a, uh, a good group who've been working on making essentially a Ruby to JavaScript transpiler. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I've heard a lot of the pitches for it and they're like, but it's Ruby and like, isn't that better? And I'm like, no, like JavaScript is great for what JavaScript does. Why do I, like, I don't have this idea of just like, there's the one approach to everything. Um, right. The same thing, of, of, that goes all the way back to thinking like SQL is not a bad language. Um, Active Record has never taken the approach that like SQL is this sort of demon that needs to be exercised. Um, we've reduced the amount of SQL you need to write on a, a regular basis. It's, um, I don't write a lot of SQL. We used to write more because Active Record didn't do as much, but it's not from this perspective of like, we have to eradicate it. Um, we do the, compre uh, the, the conceptual compression, but when I look at something like, um, Ruby to JavaScript transpiling, there's limited amounts of com conceptual compression because you still have yeah. to understand the model of what it outputs into and like, it just, it's not for me. Um, so there's that and there's something else which which is sort of funny since we just talked about microservices. Um, in I think about like 2007, we had a framework called Active Resource, uh -huh. which was essentially um, a service oriented approach like hey make a bunch of apps tie them together you can talk to them over HTTP boom right and like I I use that framework and we built a bunch of things on him and it's in those scars that I draw the fierce <laughs> opposition to microservices and service oriented architectures in general right because I ran that shit and it sucked <laughs> and you know what it hasn't gotten materially better this idea that like we replace a method call or a SQL query with an HTTP call Fuck no, as far as we can avoid it. It doesn't mean always, right? Like there sure. are times where where it, it makes sense. I think just the times that it makes sense is like 1% of the time um, compared to sort of this infatuation we've endured over the past like five plus, plus years, which is so funny because it was in sort of version 1.0 of those well, not even 102, perhaps you could think Corpa before this, but mm -hmm. like it was in a past version of this same battle that Rails was born. The WS right. Death Star was yeah. literally the first um, kind of big ideological battle that Rails picked up the other side of. Like you yeah. had WS Death Star, which was this whole service oriented thing. I remember it well. Um, yeah. Terrible sort of. Uh, <laughs> Uh, approach to it, right? It was it was uh, J2E. It was a uh, local and remote Java beans. It was all the same shit, right? And you go like all the bad ideas, all the zombie ideas of software development. They are on the same treadmill as the good ideas, and they come in vogue just as frequently as the good ideas come back in vogue. And we go like, fuck. Now, I, I mean, yeah. So, so this is, it's just, it's interesting to have been through a full clock cycle of that, right? Like I obviously, I got started with Ruby and Rails. I hadn't gone through any of the clock cycles. I'd just been on the first one. Now yeah. I've been through a couple of the loops and you just go like, yeah, it just does repeat. But anyway, active resource was a thing that essentially was like, well, maybe there's an okay way of doing services oriented architectures. And conclusion was no, no, <laughs> no. 
Like, don't pretend that um, what happens over the network is the same as what happens locally. Like, that's sure. one of the immutable laws of distributed computing. Well, yep. law number one is don't do it. Yep. Law number two is if you do do it, don't pretend that a method call is the same as, as a service invocation. They're just they're different um, time scales, and they should actually feel different. That's the other thing of this transpiling, making it all be the same language that I don't like. Like different things have different pressures. Like when I'm calling a remote object, um, it shouldn't have the same taste as calling sure. a local. It should look foreign. It yeah. should look weird. Preferably, it should even look bad. Right. Yeah. Like, this is what the idea of syntactic uh, vinegar comes from. The things you shouldn't do too often, they should look annoying and bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I, you know, those those days of trying to make soap feel like it's just a thing that you call over the network. It's like we learn like, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's, what's funny is I, I, don't, I don't think it takes either of our opinions to say that it that it didn't work because if you look around like no one writes soap apps now like the uh, every single soap app is a le is is a like the far legacy yeah. ones and i would say there are probably more cobol apps than there are soap apps at this point in time <laughs> this cobol being yes. in the news again today yes so yes um, and i think the same is going to be true for microservices people are going to look back and like I don't even, the, the funny thing about microservices is like, I don't even always know when, where the limit is between sarcasm and comedy and reality. Like, um, I think I saw a write up where, where Uber had like thousands of microservices. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure that's an actual, maybe that's an overstatement. Is that? No, no, that actual, was, that was legit what that thing said. So. Gotcha. Okay. Like, that's a thing that like people are going to find like in the ground like 20 years from now, like excavating things. And you're like, what? 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 Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that article also talked about Uber starting to do uh, macro services to which a bunch of us said, like, I, I think we already had a name for those. But anyway, that's a different conversation. So um, I think, you know, this has been great. I think we're we're kind of, we're getting towards the end here. Um, I, oh, I, I guess I have two maybe maybe quickish ones. Uh, one was, um, you know, so we've got some. You were tra we were talking about sorbet earlier and sort of typing and stuff like that. Um, we had some questions about like formatters, like syntax formatters and stuff like that. Like, oh. or not, yeah, yeah. And I, I want to know, like, oh, would you are is that something that you'd be in favor of? I mean, like Ruby's never really had that, and so uh, it's sort of becoming more a thing in in various programming languages. Maybe give your quick thoughts on that. Yeah, first I'm going to say I do not have quick thoughts on that. I only have long thoughts. <laughs> okay, um, okay. <laughs> I have such a twisted, tormented relationship with linters and formatters in general. And if there's one thing I swear sort of at most in Ruby, it's probably RuboCop. Like we run RuboCop at, um, at Basecamp with an extremely limited uh, set of rules, right? Like it's nothing like the default thing, but even the extremely limited set of rules has me swearing at the computer, like almost nothing else that I can imagine. And I'm at the point where I'm like, I understand some of the benefits, but I don't actually think they're worth it. Like I'm, I'm more on the side that like the amount of things I'm willing to let a formatter lecture me about can fit on a fucking dime. Like you can tell me about some spacing maybe at the end of a thing. Start telling me about like how I line up my things or, or where I use parentheses or whatever, and you're in for a fight. In fact, Ruby, to me, so much of the enjoyment in Ruby is these incredible subtleties hmm. of how many fucking different ways you can structure a conditional, yeah. right? Like Ruby has, I don't know, even the count, there's gotta be 60 different ways you can say if something, right? Yeah. And it is in those 60 different ways that I find half the enjoyment of writing Ruby. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it was one of those things where I knew very early on that Python was not a language for me. Mm -hmm. Because it said right in the manifesto, there should be preferably one and only one way to do things. Ruby has the exact opposite approach. There should be preferably 10,000 subtle different ways of doing things that will allow you to write just that 
particular conditional with just the right emphasis. Do you write it in the front? Do you put it at the back? Is it multi-line? Is it single line? Like there's just so much variety. Mm -hmm. And it's in that variety that I find poetry. Mm, And it is the poetry of writing Ruby code, of making those subtle distinctions, where at the end you can like, eh, should we move it around? Like where I just go like, right? Like this is, (laughs) this is like, we talked about that big smile, right? Yeah. So much of that big smile comes from not just like solving the problem, but solving it in a poetic way. And um, this is where (laughs) it is funny. Like for me, Ruby is, is almost like the uh, Turing test. By the time you can write a formatter that can accurately appreciate all these subtleties, like we're going to have general purpose AI. Like <laughs> general purpose AI is just going to be able to run the world, right? Like because all that intricacy um, is really difficult. Yeah. It really is. Um, and it's funny. It, it, where I know that this is particular about Ruby is like I don't quite feel the same thing about JavaScript. Mm. We also use a formatter in JavaScript. And JavaScript it's just more constrained. Like it doesn't have as much of the subtlety. There aren't 10,000 different ways of writing a conditional. And sometimes that often bothers me, right? But at least <laughs> sure. you're sort of constrained. But I think it also goes for the root, right? The thing, mm-hmm. the, the one most people point to is the one from Go, right? Like I think perhaps that was the one that kind of like started it yeah. where a whole community just went like, boom, we're gonna have a format. Yeah. Go is fucking a new speak kind of language. Right? Yeah. They try to reduce the scope of the whole thing down to like, hey, could there just be like five words that we say in different ways? And like, you have to build everything down of the tiniest box and yeah. you build everything up yourself. Ruby is is English in the sense of like, there's sure. fucking 10,000 different adjectives that mean just the subtle different slices of, yeah. it's, it's like the joke of, I don't even know if this is true, but I remember hearing that like um, in, in um, Newick, or I forget what the the language of Greenland is called, but there's mm-hmm. like there's like 13 different words for snow. <laughs> right, right. This is and, and this is beautiful, right? Like this is not an error. Like yeah. the, that language would be so much worse off if it had just one word for snow, right? Right. Ruby would be Ruby would suck if there was a format that said there's one way you can say if something. Hmm. I, I'd stop writing Ruby. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, not a big fan. Very much hope that um, it doesn't get included in the official language in any way. Because the other thing too is Ruby has fucking dialects. Yeah. This is this is like a cultural treasure. There's like Seattle style. Mm-hmm. There's like I remember when I first read the the Ruby standard library and I could see all the dialects in all the different libraries and like I I went like. Here's what I like, here's what I don't like. And then I wrote my own dialect, right? right? Like not only could you write in your own dialect in terms of what Ruby you wanted, active um, support is the Rails dialect of Ruby. Right. And allowing me to have my own dialect and control over it is just fucking spectacular. And like there's so much enjoyment out of that. And there's, I have such deep appreciation for that, that like it's one of those things too where we talked about like, hey, what do you like? What do you don't like? You you don't always know upfront like what turns out to be significant. The yeah. fact that Ruby is so expressive and has sixty different ways of saying if if that, mm-hmm. um, it's one of those things where like in the beginning maybe you didn't bring so much thought into it, but now you see the blossoming of culture that comes from that decision, yeah. and you go like, do not fuck with it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and and it comes in to actually it, it's the. The one way I, I try to very much restrict my commentary on what goes into Ruby Core because A, to me, almost all of it is optional. I can just choose not to do it. Yeah. And B, it's optional in the ways where if I have a better way, I can just put it in active support and I do it all the time. But <laughs> um, for example, the new underscore one we have for mm-hmm. implicit uh, yep. uh, yields in the box, it's one of those things where I like, you know what? I, I wish that wasn't, that didn't happen. And I can imagine a fucking formatter going like, hey, you're yielding a, a name variable here. Let's replace that with underscore one. And me just going like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> this is not going to happen over my dead body, right? Uh, like, this day is over. Close this laptop. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, is over. this discussion yeah. is over. Yeah, um, yeah I think, um, it, no. I, I have a very tormented relationship with formatters, and I very begrudgingly use them. And... In fact, if anything, I think whatever formatting rules should be, they should be far more constrained. Like I like the one that enforces or that that uh, pulls me back from the temptation of using single quotes, 
versus double quotes. Like I finally, after 15 years of Ruby, I, I came to the realization that trying to do the subtle distinction between single quotes and double quotes was not worth anyone's time. And even <laughs> I kept getting it wrong. So I, I committed to just always using double quotes. Yeah. Um, I'll take that. The, 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 the subtlest of, for, of formatting of linting then, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, this has been great. Uh, thank you so much for your time for doing this. Um, I hope that uh, everything's going well at home and you're, everybody's staying safe and sane. And um, I'm hoping that I'll, I'll get to see you again in person soon. And yeah, um, any, any, anything you wanna, uh, at, at, per, per a, 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 some kind of podcast, anything you'd like to promote here at the end? Um, well, the, the funny thing is, is, is I'm like I'm a uh, kind of like an involuntary promoter, like an involuntary marketer. I just can't help it because I just get excited about the things that I work on, right? Yeah. Um, that's why I work on them. Uh, I keep telling myself this every day when I get up. Like, do you know what? If if you don't want to go to work, you don't have to, yeah. right? And I tell myself that every day because it ensures that when I show up to work, I work on the things I want to work on. Because why the fuck else would I do it at this point? Sure. Like, I don't have to, right? So that that it kind of means that I end up working on things I'm really interested in yeah. um, because I could just totally not do any of this fucking shit, right? Yeah. So the things I'm really interested in right now is obviously, hey, uh, it's our new email service uh, and email client baked into one thing. It's hey.com. It's where I'm doing all my uh work research extractions for for new things in rails like whenever anyone sees like my byline in in the change logs it's always because i'm working on the next product or something else like that and i'm just backing <laughs> shit up i never just sit back like oh sunday morning let me put some new features into rails right like, yeah. that's not a thing that happens it is hmm. like really excited about working on hay right now yep. so i work on hay and then i go like hey to make hay ha huh. Um, to make a, I, I, Rails should do this for me, right? Like, why am I yeah. putting this into my application code? Bam, yank it out, put it in. Like, that's how we actually already ended up with two frameworks, Action uh, Mailbox and Active Storage. Both of those things were extracted because I wanted to do hey, and we had that code in Basecamp, and we hadn't mm -hmm. extracted it. And I'm like, I'm not fucking pulling that shit over. I'm not doing copy paste. Yeah. Uh, sorry. So let's just put it back in. So yeah. hey, is it. Um, we're we're going to push it out, hopefully. I don't know. I don't know. This summer, maybe. Let's see where the world yep. goes. Like we were <laughs> going to put it out, as we say now. Yep. Um, I was, and then I was going to go talk about it at uh, at RailsConf. But like, hey, it'll, it'll come soon enough, and we'll pull all these things out. And I hope that this pendulum that's swinging back on the majestic monolith, there's another pendulum that also swings back on um, APIs and on how to do the front end. And the pendulum is going to come fucking back, and we're going to be ready with <laughs> turbolinks. Six yeah. and a bunch of other shit that gives a complete cohesive story on it. I even awesome. have a snazzy new name for it. Awesome. Um, that that we're gonna we're gonna put together. So there's a whole unified theory of how to build apps like we built them at Basecamp. Awesome. Um, and I can't wait to share that. But uh, yeah, I, hey, when that comes out, is going to it's gonna show all of it because it's all gonna be in the box. That's where it comes from. Yeah. We, uh, we, uh, I can't wait to see it. I know that that most people can't either. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, I will see you when the world can travel again. Yes, please. Sounds right. great. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a blast. Have a good bye. -bye.